Uh, yeah, I'm I'm good to go. We'll 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 see if the uh, tech cooperates when I at the point in the talk that I need it. Okay, great. Okay, somewhat okay. doubtful, but we'll uh, well let, we'll, let's we'll just do it live. Let's have a, have a, have a look. Okay, great. Um, thanks thanks to Kino for joining us. Kino Fisher's from Julia Computing, um, and he's joining us to talk about um, using optics, the you know theoretical machinery that we all know and love, and applying them in the real world for Julia's kind of systems of reverse, reverse mode automatic differentiation. Okay, um, take it away, Kino, thanks. Excellent. Uh, so thank you everyone for joining and uh, thank you for bearing with me during the uh, initial couple uh, technical difficulties. Um, all right, so uh, brief introduction. So who am I, what do I do, you know, uh, why am I here? So I, my name is Kino Fisher. I uh, work at Julia Computing. I'm a CTO for Tools and Technologies. I run a lot of our, uh, our research programs. And basically, you know, by background, I am a, a compiler writer. So I write compilers, I write optimization passes. Uh, I write various compiler utilities. You know, I help scientists who uh, work with Julia uh, create the applications in Julia, I have making them fast. But in particular, I am not a mathematician. So, you know, this talk is actually a little bit scary to me uh, because I know a lot of you are mathematicians and I'm going to be talking about a lot of math and a lot of category theory. And even though I have taken a large number of graduate math classes, I am uh, not a working mathematician. So, I uh, apologize in advance if I mess anything up and you know, please feel free to correct me or uh, you know, make suggestions for how to word better. I would welcome that. Um, you know, I use these concepts that I'm gonna be talking about not uh, because I, um, uh, you know, I, I wanna prove things about them or because I care about the mathematical concepts per se, um, but because they help me uh, create the kinds of tools and they help me uh, figure out how my compiler passes should work, how things like uh, the automatic differentiation system that I will be talking about uh, today should work. So no proofs today, and uh, I'll leave the proofs as take home for any mathematicians in the audience who uh, uh, will be so inclined. Okay. So uh, the place I do want to start is um, by talking about forward mode AD from sort of a structural category theory style um, way. So let me switch out my slides for some notes I wrote. So I was going to do this live uh, while with writing it up uh, out on the tablet but I think that's not going to work. Um, so instead, I'm going to use the one I did. Sorry, let's zoom toolbars in the way. Um, instead, I'm going to use the one I wrote up yesterday as my, um, uh, as my practice talk. And uh, we'll, we'll use the, those notes as is. And I know there's a couple of bugs in it. So I'll, um, I'll point them out as we go. Let me move the zoom control bar out of the way. I know you probably can't see it, but it was in my way. Okay, um, so the setting I want us to consider is, um, uh, and uh, do I need to make this a little bit bigger? I, can people read this? Okay. Um, okay, so the setting I want us to consider is um, let's pick you know, some ambient category, I'm just gonna call it C. I'm not gonna impose anything on it at the moment uh, because I wanna sort of build up uh, some minimal structure that we're gonna be using to um, define a structural version of forward mode automatic differentiation. Um, so uh, I'm gonna uh, pick some category. I'm gonna have uh, some subcategory of interest, again, to be defined later, what, what's in that. Um, and I'm going to define basically a bundle in this category, except that uh, the, the bundle itself might, might be in the, in the ambient category, but we require our 
um, uh, our base object uh, to be in the subcategory. And that, that'll, uh, that'll become important like four slides down the line. Uh, but for now, you know, standard definition of a bundle, uh, standard definition of, of, of sections over the bundle in, in the category theoretic sense. Um, and uh, yeah, so we'll, we'll, we'll start there. So that's sort of literally like, this is the only definition that, that I wanna start with. So I assume everybody's on board. Like I want this to be super interactive. So if like anybody wants to ask any questions or, or challenge me on anything, like I, I, I wanna be very clear, particularly on this first part, um, because I'm gonna be using it to build some intuition as to how these structures work. Um, and I think that'll make it easier to talk about what I have on the slides later when I discuss the actual results. So uh, please do interrupt me if there's any questions. So, so what's the symbol on the upper right, right where you're, um, is that like a gamma? Up, yeah, it's a gamma, down? sorry about that. Okay. So it's, uh, um, yeah, some it's, of the maps uh, from X to TX are considered gamma E. Uh, correct. Okay. Uh, yeah, I, I wrote the gamma <laughs> wrong side around. I, as I said, there's some bugs in these nodes. I was gonna do it correctly live, but gotcha. uh, uh, yeah, so uh, I, I apologize for that. Uh, are, are they exactly yeah, the uh, ones, the, the gamma ones are the, the ones that are sections, right? Gamma is uh, the, the gamma section. ones are exactly the sections okay. uh, for my particular bundle. So I am not like, it's not some special set of sections. We just consider uh, all the, like all, all the S, like, right? Like we have like literally like think of a very small category. Like there's like, you know, you can write down the morphisms, like look at each of them, like check if the diagram commutes, uh, uh, those are my gammas. Okay, so this is like, this is the setting that I wanna be in. So, so let's start here. Okay, so let's, uh, okay. This is two pages at once. Let me zoom in to the relevant part. Uh, yeah, okay. Um, uh, okay, so let's do like the trivial, most trivial possible example um, to uh, talk, about, talk about this definition. So uh, we're gonna not worry about the subcategory thing for the next couple of uh, examples. So let's say, you know, we have a category, it has one object, it has, you know, uh, two morphisms and then the compositions thereof. So, you know, F and F compose F and, and so on. Uh, but basically, like the identity, uh, which should have been drawn with a circle, but whatever, uh, and F are the two um, uh, are the two basic morphisms. So here, um, you know, we we can uh, there's the two possible choices we have for um, uh, what we what we can uh, uh, what we can define as a bundle in in this category. So we can uh, uh, we have both uh, we have the object both be its bundle and itself. And we can um, uh, either use uh, the identity or we can use F or you know, any of the higher compositions of F uh, as, um, as the bundle map. And if uh, we choose the identity, then you know, the identity is a section. And if we choose F or any of the other ones, then there's no sections. I mean, th this is just a, a trivial example, but I'm just introducing some notations here because we will use this category again. Uh, later, but I, I assume everybody uh, is on board with that so far. Okay, so let's do uh, you know a slightly uh, similar complexity example, but slightly more complicated. So we still have one object. I'm sort of deceptively drawing it as two dots, but it's it's one object. And the iteration of this category is that sort of the, you know the object itself has two elements that you can swap, uh, and and those are your your two morphisms. Um, uh, and again, I should have drawn it differently, which was my plan. Uh, for the live, but uh, so here we have, um, uh, we again have two bundles, but in this case, you know, they're, they're somewhat symmetric in that they both have uh, their uh, base map as a section. Okay, uh, that was sort of the trivial examples. So um, now let's get to the media example that Basically combines the two um, uh, the two previous examples into uh, into one. So uh, we have a category with two objects. Um, the uh, or the ambient category has two objects. The base category that we care about has only uh, one object, and obviously only the morphisms for that one object. 
So in particular, it's the same category as the one that I had in the uh, in the first example, where you know you have the identity and f and all the compositions of f. Um, so um, uh, so I, I wrote down I wrote down all the morphisms that we have in the ambient category. So we have the identity on the one dot object, the identity on the two dot objects. Um, we have f. I'm adding another morphism. I'm calling uh, df, which is um, you know, I, a priori similar to F, but just in the, uh, for, for the uh, two dot object. Um, and then I'm, I have two uh, morphisms that I'm writing explicitly that form the, um, uh, the base map for my bundle, as well as uh, one particular uh, identified uh, section. So this is sort of like the minimal construction in which Talking about what I want to talk about uh, makes sense. Um, so, like this is this is sort of the the list of morphisms that we need, and and the list of morphisms where where it makes sense to talk about. So, uh, uh, everybody happy with sort of what our minimal category is that we're talking about here? Uh, okay. So uh, the bundle, obviously, as you can imagine, you know, I constructed that morphism in particular uh, to be the bundle map. We have. Um, uh, uh, we have, you know, uh, uh, the, the set of sections is, is just the one morphism, um, and um, I uh, now I'm I'm making the the following claim slash uh, definition. So I want to define a functor in this category, in particular from the subcategory to the ambient category um, that you know, makes the following mapping. So it maps, um, uh, yeah, it maps the one dot object to the two dot object. Uh, it maps the, um, uh, the identity on the other object to the identity, obviously, and then it just maps uh, F to DF. So um, um, most trivial possible um, way that we could, we could define this functor. And this particular construction, so this kind of functor on in this setting where we have you know, this category and this bundle, I'm going to call uh, the forward differentiation functor. And OK, so th that might be a little weird. Like, you know, how do we get to differentiation? Like, we haven't talked about derivatives at all. There's no sort of uh, continuous structure. Um, Sorry, can, can, I start can I interrupt? Can I interrupt? Um, yeah, are you going to be? This category a lot is it like kind of the, the most basic example of forward differentiation somehow or yes. is it just a past example? Okay, then uh, I, I think it's, maybe we should understand it better, or I should, or something. If it's yeah, going to so be it's, central, it's um, it's it's not going to be super central, but I do think this is key to understanding what I'm saying. So I, I would encourage you to like challenge me on this definition because I'm going to be renaming this category shortly to make make a connection. So. Okay, so I understood the first category to be the, the monoid of natural numbers. It had one object and it had uh, a morphism from that object to itself for every natural number. Zero was the identity, F was one, F squared was two, and you compose by adding natural numbers. Uh, uh, yes, yeah, yeah, that, 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 that's an equivalent category, yes. Yeah, and I understood the second category to be the full subcategory of set spanned by the two element set. So it's like all functions from two to two. There's four of them, four morphisms in that category. Is that um, what you wanted or is that not what you wanted for the second category? Uh, no, I just, wanted, I just wanted the identity and uh, and the swap. So the swap compose swap is identity. Okay, it was, so Z mod two, yeah. it was like uh, Z mod the two element group. Basically, yeah. Okay. I, didn't, yeah then, I didn't write it down that way because I like, I like, I like sort of the diagrams and like in some sense, I think putting like, this is what it actually is on it. But yes, I, I think that's, that's equivalent. Okay, so then what is this, what is this new category? So it's got two objects or yeah. one called it's dot. Two objects. One called two dot. Okay, yeah, it's got, it's it's got, got two got, objects. It's got the like. It's got both what, of the objects called, from the original categories. Sorry, can yeah. we call the first object dot and the second object two dot? Uh, yeah, sure. Okay, what are the morphisms from dot to dot? Uh, the morphisms from dot to dot are the identity and uh, a morphism I call f. 
So not the natural F numbers, but just one F, only one F, okay. not F compose F. And uh, F compose F is like uh, all the all the all the Fs. So okay, F so F natural F numbers. F, uh, natural numbers. Fair. Yep. And what are the morphisms from two dot to two dot? Uh, it's it's another copy of the same category. So it's two. There's two of them. And what are uh, the maps from dot because there's a swap in the identity? And what are the morphisms from dot uh, to two like, dot? Like I'm not using the swapping identity here. I just did it. Oh, it, There's just it, one it, it's here, but I'm not. I, I don't need it, so I'm not writing it. I just wrote in it this, out to have some example. In, in the category we're talking about, there's only one morphism from two dot to two dot. Uh, correct. Well, and the identity, obviously, but yeah. There's two morphisms one, from two dot to two dot. And one, how many maps are there? Yep. Yeah, and how many maps are there from dot to two dot? Uh, from dot to two dot, there's one morphism, the uh, inclusion morphism up here. So there's uh, uh, just the one. Uh, yes. One generator, maybe. So you could also do F and then I, or F squared, then I. I, I th that's, well, uh, you, you end up with, uh, with DF. So uh, I, um, uh, yeah, let, let's say one generator. Like it doesn't, morally, it doesn't really matter. But yeah, let's let's say okay. one generator. So I, I don't know whether to be asking these questions whether this category is important. No, no, it's good. It's good. It's good. Okay, like it's, so it sounds like I have I and F of I, but that you call F then I, you call that DF maybe. Uh, I'm not sure. Okay. Uh, well, it's it's I, uh, or, or rather, um, like not not a priority, but. The way I uh, want to define this category is that it it just so happens that um, uh, so 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 a priori I don't want to impose that, um, but I, like I, I think the construction works either way. So you can um, uh, you can you can impose it this way, or you can just think of it as you know you, these are the the generating morphisms, and you have all compositions. Um, okay. Okay, um, I think I'm pretty good. I, yeah, thanks. Yeah, no, sorry, I should have, I should have probably been more precise about this, but this is the, you know, not, not mathematician part. <laughs> okay, yeah, yeah, no problem, thanks. Um, now, I have a question. I, please, like, like on, on, on this, this part in particular, like, you know, uh, please ask any clarifying questions uh, and, and like, oh. challenge me on any of this. Like, I, I, I have absolutely no sense that like, I'm actually doing this correctly. I just want to. I'm just trying to give some intuition here for why I'm using uh, the the structures, and, and this will come in handy. Question: Are are yes. you going to relate what you're talking about to differentiation? Uh, next next slide. Yes. Okay. Cool. Um, okay. So so we're happy we're happy on this category and and this functor. Okay. Uh, so uh, next slide. So this is the. Uh, this is the same category written in sort of uh, the same way. Um, so we again have two objects and I'm gonna call them, you know, R and R squared. And yeah, they, they are the real numbers, but like it, structurally, it's the exact same category of uh, that we just had. So in particular, I'm not gonna take all the morphisms that you could possibly write for the real numbers. Um, but I'm just gonna have the same morphisms that we had before. And for concreteness, um, I'm gonna call my, um, uh, I'm, I'm gonna say my morphism F is like some, some particular function, let's call it sine. Um, and then my morphism F uh, on this other object, which is R squared, I'm gonna say, um, uh, I, I'm going to say it has sine and and y times times cosine x like that. That's what it does on. Uh, that's what the, what the morphism df is. But again, structurally, uh, the exact same category as on the on the previous slide. So are, are people like comfortable with me making this this kind of statement? So df is a map from r squared to r squared. DF is a map from R squared to R squared. On the first component, it does sine x. On the second component, it, was, it does y cosine x. Okay. Uh, where x and y are the, are the two components of R squared. Okay. Uh, so we have the, 
uh, we have the exact same construction here and I'm making a particular claim, which is that the partial derivative in the sense of uh, like ordinary calculus definition of, of partial derivatives is um, this particular composition of morphism. So I, I cheated kind of, I added one additional morphism, which is the uh, projection onto the second coordinate. Um, I was planning to write it as uh, the composition of the metric and, uh, and the inclusion map um, uh, at, at X. So you can think of it that way, but for, um, uh, for, for R, it, it ends up being the same as, as projection onto the second coordinate. Um, so I, I cheated a little bit. I added an extra morphism uh, for, for the purpose of, uh, of this particular claim. So the claim is that the ordinary partial derivative um, uh, in, in the real numbers can be computed by uh, this particular composition of morphisms um, uh, with, this, uh, with this set of objects. Uh, so what, what do we do? So we take the partial derivative at a particular point y, and I apologize for my inconsistent symbols. I wanted to fix that also. Uh, but so we, we take it at a particular, uh, can, I, can I write with this? Yeah. So we take it at a particular y. Um, this y we run through the inclusion map. Uh, we take our functor, uh, we take whatever our, our morphism in, um, uh, uh, in, in, in the subcategory is, we run it through the functor and then um, we apply that to the result of the inclusion. And then we, at the end, we project it back down uh, uh, we project it back down to R. Um, okay, uh, is the is the definition clear of of what I'm doing here? Does that say ought D? Is that an G is in ought D? Or uh, where does it say G is in upstairs? Oh, uh, uh, the automorphisms of of the uh, subcategory. Yeah. Oh. So this is for invertible maps, G. Uh, they mean endomorphism? Like that's just right, I mean endomorphism. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, okay. My, my, okay. My apologies. I see, I see, okay. My apologies, yeah, uh, that, um, yeah, 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 no, yeah you're, you're correct. Um, I mean endomorphism. Okay. Yeah. Um, yeah, thank you, thank you for the catch. I, uh, I, I got my morphisms confused. Um, uh, okay. Uh, so if we're comfortable with this definition, then let's uh, do an example. I need to zoom bars in my way again. Um, okay, so let's do an example. So um, let's do um, let's do the basic. Uh, how do I clear annotations? Uh, uh, clear. Uh, clear all drums. Okay. Um, okay, so let's do an example. So let's do uh, partial sine partial x. So let's run it through this particular composition. Um, uh, yeah, let's run it through this particular composition. So we, uh, we take our inclusion map, we end up at uh, y comma one in r squared. We apply um, the uh, the functor to sign, we get this map df that I defined, which if you'll remember is um, uh, sine x, y cosine x. So um, afterwards we're, we're in R squared still, we end up with um, uh, a y, a sine y cosine y, and then we are projecting back down using, oops, that should be pi, uh, pi two, um, uh, on, onto the second coordinate and we get, uh, we get the derivative. So at least for this trivial example, like, uh, this this claim holds. Okay, are we comfortable with this example? Okay. Um, if, if not, please again let me know. Um, but I will move on to the next example. So. Um, uh, sorry, you know, I I am yes. not very comfortable because you know you have a one, and then it yes. goes to cos cosine y. I mean, yes. How does it go? <laughs> I yeah. I so if if we look up here. Um, so I have my map df defined on x comma y. 
right? And I and this is what I say it does on R squared. It gives me sine y cosine uh, y cosine x, um, and maybe I should have um, I should have used a different symbol for y below. But but I, I, are you comfortable with this definition of the map uh, df? Yes. Yes. Okay. Uh -huh. And over here on the left, I said that my functor from the subcategory to the ambient category uh, maps f to df. Right. Uh -huh. Okay. Okay. So uh, here, um, my f is sine. Uh -huh. Okay, which is which I defined up here, f is f is yeah. sine. And my df is, you know, this this particular function that I just wrote up here. Right. Uh, so all I'm saying here is that I'm applying this map uh, df to the point, you know, um, uh, y comma one. Uh, and I, I apologize for, for duplicating notation, but um, like like plug yeah. in plug in you know y comma one for for the x y here and you know what you get is sine y cosine y. Okay, now that that I see what you mean. I, I think I was reading this y as gamma and I was saying what? Yeah, what yeah, yeah I know, I know. This is this is I, okay. I always do this and I, I was going through and fixing it, but yeah, this is one of the. Um, Thank you. Sorry. No, no, no. You're you're absolutely good. Like this is this is my bad. I I I always do this. People always get confused by it. I, I'm careful about it when I actually give a talk. But uh, again, these are my you know uh, this is my practice run from yesterday. So I I, I did a little rushed. Um, okay, but but so we're comfortable that like this definition at least on on sine gives us gives us the derivative cosine. Yes, sir. Yes. Okay. Great. Uh, hey, you know, so, I'm, I'm confused about. Yeah. Like, well, why, why are you bringing in, well, I, I have a guess that you're not really trying to do partial differentiation, right? It, you're bringing in partial differentiation is kind of an accommodation to this forward mode thing. I, I think. Uh, not, no, for, forward mode is in some sense partial differentiation. Uh, yeah. I mean, what, it's push forwards of, of tangent vectors. Um, but if, if you were, I think I'm confused. Are you wanting, are you talking about differentiation or are you talking about a particular differentiation algorithm? Like it, it, uh, um, kind of both. Um, okay. Because if you were just talking about differentiation, I don't think you'd be bringing in the partial derivatives. I think you're bringing in the partial derivatives because you've got these pairs going on. And these pairs maybe have to do with the fact that you're thinking in terms of part, uh, forward differentiation. Um. So, we, so, we can come back to that question I mean, later. I wonder, maybe I, I'm keen to see where this is all going, and I'd love yeah. to see so it. Well, well, we, we can keep going. I, I think, yeah, I let's think come back. Is, I think the point is that, so the point I want to make here is that I define something completely structurally. You know, as we saw in the previous example, you know, I, I didn't talk about any continuous structure at all. Um, and like, I didn't talk about um, like chain rules, and I didn't talk about any of that. Like, I, I defined something very, very structural. And I'm making the claim that for correct choices of what this functor is, I mean, in, in this category, we didn't have any choice uh, because I only have the two morphisms f and df, but in general, you have a bunch of choices for the, what this functor can be. Uh, and I'm claiming that for correct choices of this functor uh, that obeys this structure in some sense, uh, you recover the ability to compute partial derivatives. Um, Without you know uh, talking about uh, in in some sense you know continuous or differentiable structures, of course you know the, the uh, differentiable structure imposes a constraint on how you choose that functor. Um, but sort of structurally, um, like there, there isn't really anything to do with like continuous structures that that defines the structure. So uh, the point I want to make is that you can talk about the compositional structure of differentiation without actually talking about um, like the differentiable structure on the thing that you're differentiating itself. And that becomes important because in some sense in computers, you don't really have a differentiable structure either, right? Like you have something that approximates a differentiable structure, 
but you don't really have a differentiable structure. So it's very useful to be able to talk about you know, differentiation in a purely structural sense. Um, can, you sense say that, yeah. can, can you in any sense say that you're talking about differentiation correctly? Without I, bringing in what, what differentiation means, which is the, involves the continuum. No, no. So the, the correctness of differentiation is a constraint on what functors you're allowed to choose. Um, and, and in particular, you, you, in, in like many senses, the kind of differentiation we do on computers is not correct um, because differentiation does not commute with approximation. Um, so uh, you, know, but, you will yeah. not actually end up with, you know, the mathematically correct answer on a computer. Um, I, I, I worry. I, I, would like to, I think I'd like to hear where the keenest talk is going. I mean, we should have. Okay. Yeah, we can like. <laughs> Yes, yeah. I, 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 have, I have a lot more. Like in some sense, this was uh, was supposed to be non controversial. Uh, yeah. So, so you know, um, so we started at nine ten at 10, 10 after the hour, and we usually yeah. go fifty minutes. So you have about twenty minutes left, and I think so, a lot of people at least are interested in the kind of Julia side and the optics yeah, and where, yeah, 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 yeah. Great. great okay. Um, so um, I will. I will. Okay. We can we can come back to this at the end, and maybe in the in, in the non recorded portion, uh, we can we can elaborate on a little bit. Um, but so let me uh, let me go through this quickly and um, uh, basically say say what I, I, I want to say on this, and then I'll switch back to the slides and talk about optics. Uh, so um, uh, this is this example does uh, sine sine uh, sine compose sine uh, in the exact same way, and you get the derivative of of sine compose sine um, uh, using the exact same procedure I showed on the previous slide. So. Um, um, let me uh, let me skip that. Um, let me skip out of this and, and, and switch back to the slides to talk about um, uh, to talk about implementations. So, um, uh, okay. Uh, so uh, here is a Julia implementation of basically this exact same thing that I just talked about mathematically, um, except I'm using a particular embedding uh, through polymorphism into objects. So the analogy um, to think about is that, um, uh, rather than uh, taking my objects to be um, uh, 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 my objects to be uh, uh, real numbers, and then you, you know some are, are squared, I'm taking my objects to be you know uh, Julia objects, and then pairs of Julia objects. Um, uh, of course, this is uh, you know Julia objects can be pairs, so in, in some sense, um, like uh, that's the full category. But for now, like Let's think of like you know floating point numbers uh, as Julia objects. So I, I literally mean like you know basically an object in memory. Like I don't mean like a real number. I mean like a floating point number as a Julia object. Uh, so uh, Julia defines somewhere in the standard library uh, some morphisms. Let's say um, uh, plus and multiply, but you could do sign. So later in the slides, I, I did the same example with two morphisms uh, from the product category. But you know, let's uh, like I, I, I'll trust that like uh, morally, like you'll believe me that we can extend what I just talked about, uh, sort of to the to the two input case. Um, so uh, this basically implements that. Uh, so um, you know, we have we have a a a, a, a struct that has two elements, uh, completely analogous to uh, you know our squared in the previous example, and then we define. Uh, we define our various morphisms. We define the inclusion morphisms, what I called uh, partial sub X. Uh, we define the projection morphism, um, which just projects onto the um, onto the first coordinate. Uh, we define the what I call pi two, the thing that that uses the metric. Um, I'm just calling dx, and then we're defining um, we're defining some rules, and this is sort of the the key to this embedding. Uh, is that we're using polymorphism 
to basically implicitly encode um, what this functor does on my basic morphisms. So in this example, my basic morphisms would be addition and multiplication. Um, and through polymorphism, I'm defining that, okay, on uh, this bundle, which I'm, you know, this called the tangent bundle struct here, um, I'm, uh, I'm defining I'm defining what those morph what the the DF equivalent does on uh, uh, on, on these bundles. Um, so this is completely analogous. I didn't draw the uh, the diagram, um, but I, I think this is this is an, um, an an important point to understand. So this is completely completely analogous, exact same construction. Uh, and on the right, I'm just showing you know I can take uh, derivatives of polynomials. Um, and obviously, if we did sign, you know, we, we would get the exact same answer as before. Okay, uh, I'm going to move on from this, but if, if there's questions about it, we can come back. Um, so that was forward mode AD. Um, and let me let me switch back to slideshow mode. Um, okay, so that was uh, forward mode AD, but um, uh, uh, forward mode AD uh, doesn't really work for lots of problems, including in particular. Uh, pl uh, problems, you know, when you want to train a machine learning model, um, or when you want to do sensitivity analysis um, in various scientific models. Um, and the problem here is entirely one of computational complexity. Um, so this makes it sometimes a little hard to talk about this kind of stuff uh, with people studying, um, at, say, differential geometry. Uh, because in some sense, there they can do all sorts of constructions that do not preserve the computational complexity of your forward computation. Um, so a lot of this stuff doesn't really matter in um, like uh, traditional literature on differentiation um, because they don't care about computational complexity. Okay, so forward. Uh, so uh, there's another. There's something else you can do called uh, reverse mode automatic differentiation. So this is not a new idea. It's been around since uh, the 80s. Uh, so, oops. Uh, so this is uh, a figure I stole from a talk by uh, Perlmutter, who's one of the you know big names in implementing uh, implementing automatic differentiation systems. Um, and uh, this was one of the earliest systems that did. Uh, reverse mode automatic differentiation, in this case, um, on uh, Fortran programs. So it takes Fortran programs in as a uh, as text, and it spits out another Fortran program that, you know, computes something derivatively. Um, I'm just going to uh, leave it at that for, for the purpose of the discussion. Um, so uh, there's uh, a, so, uh, another uh, uh, prior work that I thought was worth highlighting is um, uh, this one from uh, 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 Perlmutter and um, and Siskind. Uh, so this this paper is called um, uh, uh, th this is a paper generally referred to as Lambda, the ultimate backpropagator, and it basically um, uh, it, it shows a way in basically a, an untyped lambda calculus to do reverse mode automatic differentiation um, um, using lambdas. So to, to encode reverse mode automatic differentiation in um, untyped lambda calculus. And in particular, I pulled out um, uh, I pulled out one figure from this paper. Um, and I, I think uh, probably to people in the seminar in particular, like, this kind of figure might starting might start looking a, a little familiar. Um, so you know you have some um, uh, you have some forward computation, and then at the end you know you have some backward computation that, that sort of goes backwards, and um, you know you have you have some rules for um, uh, for doing things in the middle um, that you know basically reverse uh, uh, reverse all the arrows in the original thing. Uh, okay, so this is this is sort of prior work. Um, I uh, um, uh, okay. Uh, 
I had a whole section here on how on doing examples of doing reverse mode automatic differentiation manually. Um, but I think in the interest of time, I'm gonna do it, like I was gonna draw it out with, with diagrams that I think help intuition, but I think in the interest of time, I'm gonna do it using code. Um, since that's what I, I wanted to end up. And if you know if we get completely confused, um, I think we can use the, the question time or the, the post-seminar time to, um, uh, to do the diagrams because I do think they're helpful for building intuition. Um, um, but okay, so how does, um, so uh, we basically have an implementation of this method um, from the, um, uh, Perlmutter and Siskin paper uh, to do reverse mode automatic differentiation using um, uh, using closures, uh, which is basically you know what they what they argued for in this paper. Now it's a little different in Julia because um, you have to account for various uh, forms of control flow that you don't have in anti lambda calculus, and you have to. Um, so to do it on, on different kinds of data structures. So the algorithm ends up looking quite different, uh, but morally it's the exact same thing. So uh, let's go through how this works. Um, so uh, we create, uh, we have some sort of forward function I'm calling foo, uh, you know, it does some sort of computation in this case, uh, basically a basic neural network computation. And I want to lift it to some other function I'm calling grad foo uh, that you know does something on each of these uh, on each of these statements um, both in the forward pass and then generates another function that in some sense goes through all of the previous statements backwards um, and you know there's some mapping of inputs from the original functions to output of the other functions that it generates and inputs or uh, outputs of the original functions to inputs of this um, uh, of this closure that we create. Um, so I'm, I'm gonna, I, I think I'm gonna take the punchline up front and then talk about it later. Uh, but, but this pattern um, is an encoding of optics. Um, and I'm gonna talk about that, but I think if I say that now, uh, to people that know, uh, to people that know it, I, I think it might help uh, contextualize uh, some of what I'm about to talk about. Um, so uh, my claim is that that this pattern, where you transform, uh, or the, that uh, the, the thing on the right encodes in some sense um, uh, an optic in in code. Okay, but let's continue with um, uh, how this transformation actually works. So we, you know, have uh, five statements. Uh, as I said, they map to five statements in the forward pass. And then in some sense, they map to five other statements in reversed order in, um, in this closure. Uh, okay, in this slide, I'm gonna skip. Um, so this, uh, I'm, I'm just gonna briefly mention it. So there's uh, terminology from machine learning. Um, so basically when machine learning happened in uh, in 2010, um, they completely reinvented automatic differentiation, completely disregarded all the earlier literature. Um, so there's a lot of terminology that comes out of the machine learning world that doesn't really take account of uh, this functional approach to, um, uh, uh, um, uh, to doing automatic differentiation. And um, uh, so uh, they usually have a data structure called a tape. Um, so uh, the point I'm making here, and I, I didn't talk about uh, the tape, it was in the, the slides that I skipped, um, but uh, the point I'm making here is basically that if you do a closure conversion on uh, the closure that you get from this embedding, you recover what the, um, uh, or you recover a data structure that is completely analogous to what the machine learning folks um, would call a tape. Uh, so for, for those of you who know who that is, um, you know, it's the same, the same algorithm and there's, there's a sort of an uh, exact um, uh, equivalence between, between uh, tape-based automatic differentiation and, 
um, this sort of um, transformation based on the wrong differentiation. Okay, so, uh, you know, uh, given that they basically figured out how to do this in 2008 and how to encode this, like, why am I here at all talking about like weird category theory things when um, like we basically know how to do reverse mode automatic differentiation. Um, so the problem you run into is that people wanna do uh, reverse mode automatic differentiation at, uh, at higher orders. And uh, this works in the sense that, um, you know, this uh, transformation is uh, in, in some sense an endo functor. Um, you know, you put in Julia code and you get out Julia code. So uh, to the extent that your know, implementation is correct, uh, you can apply it again and you will be able to recover second derivatives. Um, the problem is that uh, it's not the way that you want to compute second derivatives. Uh, so on this slide, on the right, th this is not meant to be understood. This is, this is for humor. Uh, this is uh, uh, some of my notes from when I was trying to figure out, okay, what is actually like the structural properties of uh, this repeated application of things like on particular examples. Um, and like, I was drawing all these crazy diagrams and trying to figure out like, you know, what does the compiler need to recognize in order to be able to optimize this? Um, like what, uh, uh, like what? What do these structures even look like? Like, uh, how do I uh, talk about them? Um, and like, I, as I, the, as the illustration indicates, I was like feeling like a caveman, like just scribbling symbols and not really understanding what I was doing. Um, so, I, I, I after you know a, a good month of this. Um, I, uh, I asked uh, uh, on, uh, I, I asked some of the folks in the Julia world um, who are more uh, category theory savvy, uh, savvy and said, you know, hey, I'm doing this thing. It has this sort of like uh, combined forward and backward structure in this forward pass and this backwards pass. Um, like, you know, I, I wrote up sort of a, a semi-formalization of it and said, hey, does anybody know of any structure in category theory or like in functional programming or anything that um, matches what I need here that could sort of help me think about uh, particularly higher order reverse mode automatic differentiation uh, in a way that separates the structural concerns from uh, the concerns about um, uh, you know, doing doing the differentiation itself. Like, you know, just to uh, let you know, you've probably got a, um, I don't know, maybe a few minutes left, five or great. five to ten minutes. Yeah, I'll uh, I'll, uh, I'll I'll be able to uh, I'll be able to wrap up. Uh, I mean, th this is kind of where the where the media part is, so maybe I, I should have uh, done it, done it slower. But I, I'll say all the things, and then we can stick around later to, to go into some of the details. If that works. Thanks. Okay. Uh, okay. So somebody pointed me to uh, the paper by Riley called "Categories of Optics," and you know, all of you are much more familiar with optics than me. So uh, I'm gonna go I'm I'm gonna go through this quite quickly. But in some sense, like optics were exactly what I needed to encode uh, this particular transformation uh, that we were doing for reverse mode automatic differentiation. Um, and I'm, I'm going to skip that. And in particular, um, like the claim I'm sort of making is that there's a very direct analogy um, between. Um, uh, 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 this optic construction where the base category is Riemannian manifolds um, and what you sort of get is um, uh, a way to compute pullbacks of differential one forms and optics over Julia code um, where what you get is reverse mode automatic differentiation. And this works in exactly the same way that this functor that I described at the start for forward mode AD, you know, gives me partial derivatives in R and R squared and gives me, you know, forward mode AD in this code snippet that I showed. 
Um, so this is sort of why I spend a lot of time on it is because I, I think the optic stuff is kind of complicated to explain, but uh, it's like the way in which this analogy works is, is completely analogous uh, to what I did before in forward mode. Um, and I think the forward mode version is a little easier to understand. Um, so this is sort of my claim. Uh, we can talk about it a little bit more. Um, so, but I, I do need a little bit more fancy stuff. And this is sort of the part of the talk where I'm saying like, hey, I'm not a mathematician, but this is sort of the kinds of constructions that I found useful. Uh, would be really handy if somebody like wanted to write a paper that uh, did some of this treatment a little more formally. Um, so um, I am defining here like something that looks like an optic, but has uh, three holes in it. Um, uh, you know, I'm defining it this way. Uh, and then the other thing I am uh, using is um, basically uh, optic applied to itself. And uh, diagrammatically, uh, that looks a little bit like this. And uh, again, like uh, Riley, the, the original paper had a, a construction a little bit like this. Uh, it's not the exact same construction that I'm using. Um, and uh, there's some more complications that I'm, I'm happy to talk about. Uh, but morally, uh, so these are two constructions that I'm using. And uh, okay, so uh, this is how the, the, uh, the second order one composes. Um, I can come back to it. Uh, but the key point is um, that these are equivalent structures in some sense. Um, and I, I think di diagrammatically, it's easy to see how the isomorphism goes. Uh, so the isomorphism goes by uh, pushing down the residual ML into you know, the uh, MO, M, MO prime, and MR. Um, and and you know, it's not, not really diagrammatically difficult to see, but in the code embedding, these two look very, very, very different. Um, and the, the key insight is that you can actually use uh, the first embedding to do uh, the, the, the embedding on the top to do higher order AD which naturally, because of this nesting structure, uh, the uh, repeated application of AD, uh, you would end up with, um, uh, with the kind of structure that you see on the bottom. Um, okay, and uh, this is what this looks like in code. I think for time, I'm gonna like treat it as pretty pictures and iterate through it. And we can um, uh, come back to it uh, for questions. Um, uh, but yeah, so this is um, uh, in, in some sense, like this is an encoding of um, uh, this isomorphism uh, between uh, the first kind of structure and the second kind of structure. And um, it's kind of nonsense. So if you write it down in code, it makes absolutely no sense. And this is not the worst of them. Um, like there's a third order version and a version that generates it for arbitrary orders. And just like writing it down in code, it makes absolutely no sense to me. But in some sense, it encodes the structure of what second order ADE looks like. So what I'm using a category theory and this uh, notion of optics for is basically like drawing these diagrams that you know, I can write down and then using the diagrams, I can tra trace through and write down in code uh, what the isomorphism is. And if I do that, I get correct second order derivatives out. And um, like, in, why, why, like uh, why does it matter? Like if I got correct second order derivatives in one way, why do I care? Um, it's because the first embedding is more efficient. Uh, than the other embedding, uh, because in the other embedding, you need to tra uh, keep track of all these residuals separately. And in particular, the ML embedding um, is very complicated to embed. Uh, ML, this residual down here, is very complicated to embed. So by using the structure at the top, I can reuse the exact same embedding uh, that I'm using for first order optics 
and um, it's faster because I added compiler support to make that fast. Uh, so I apologize if that was hard to understand. I, uh, um, uh, but I'm, I'm happy to answer any questions and, and, and we'll go back and, um, and talk about it. So I, I, I hope this was uh, at least somewhat comprehensible the last part. Okay, great. Thanks, Kino. Um, I really let's thank our speaker and um, then we can have some discussion. Yeah, and again, my apologize for the jumble talk a little bit. Uh, I wanted to, like, I thought I was speaking now, so I had, you know, plan to uh, yeah, fix the tech issues and, and fix some of those typos in the, in the slides. Um, but I hope it was at least somewhat comprehensible despite the, the mess up on my part. Great, okay. Well, okay, please you know, cha challenge me on this, you know, tell me it's complete nonsense and then we'll, we'll have a debate on it. Um, I'm, I'm here for it. Uh, I'll start. Yeah. Um, I'm, I'm still like confused and disturbed about the relationship between what you're saying and uh, yes. differentiation. Yes. Uh, like um, it, 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 I, I guess a couple of things. So if, if correctness isn't guiding you, yes. like w what is? And, and, and then related to that, like why would you or anyone care about this code if you're not saying um, that it relates so to the like, mathematical operation of differentiation? I'm not caring about correctness in the sense that I'm not trying to prove things. So this is not an application of category theory to like, you know, so like often, often people think, okay, category theory, like we're in the world of like, uh, you know, dependently typed programming languages where we're trying to encode um, like mathematical proofs um, through some sort of uh, Curry Howard thing in my dependently type programming language. And, you know, I'm using the category theory structure to sort of guide how that encoding goes. Uh, so that is not what I'm doing. What I like, what my goal is, is like mm, train machine learning models. Okay. Well, yeah. okay. But like, if you throw a random algorithm and a machine learning, right, problem, and you call it differentiation, it's not going to do the right thing unless it is differentiation. Uh, it's not going to do the right thing unless it's approximately differentiation. Uh, okay. So are you claiming that this is approximately differentiation? And it, I'm claiming it, that for appropriate choices of this functor. So like you have some base. So like, so that's, that's the point that I wanted to make. Let me, let me go back. Um, uh, so let me let me go back to uh, let me let me go back to, to this. So you need to choose some functor. Like th this is this is a choice that you need to make, and you in some sense need to encode it. Yeah. Um, so my claim is that if the category that you're working in is Riemannian manifolds and you choose this functor in such a way that it takes a morphism on the, um, on the manifold to its differential, then I'm claiming it is exactly differentiation in that category. However, yeah. at the same time, I'm claiming that, okay, now I'm switching categories to like, where my objects are like, you know, basically Julia data types and the elements of my objects are, you know, literally like bits in memory that encode some, uh, some things. So it's, you know, in some sense, completely discrete, you know, no continuous structure at all. Um, but you know, I have floating point numbers. They, in some sense, approximate uh, the real numbers. And my claim is that if I choose on you know, some particular set of primitives, because the way that you build 
programming languages. Like if I sort of translate it into a category uh, theory sense, you know, you, you write down all your objects and then you write down some set of generating morphisms. You know, they're probably gonna be like, you know, addition on floating point numbers and addition on integers and addition on uh, like, um, uh, addition on in, uh, addition on matrices and like you know multiplication and like there's some set of like primitive op operations and then you know you get all compositions thereof but like you don't really get continuous functions like sine you know you get some ap approximate version of sine that like evaluates a polynomial that approximates sine and like you know to the precision that you can get on the computer you know it is sine but it's it's not really continuous um, so I'm claiming that what you do is you define this functor on all of your primitives. Um, and what I'm then claiming is that if you then apply this functor to any morphism, um, like in particular, some like hugely complicated composition, like maybe some polynomial that evaluates sine, you know, approximately, uh, then what I get out is um, uh, approximately the derivative of sine. Uh, yeah. Now there's complications here because obviously, um, you know, the implementation of sine will be a polynomial of some order, and the derivative will lower the uh, will lower the order by by one. So you can't do it infinitely. Um, at least if you only define your functor on like plus and multiply to get polynomials implicitly. Uh, however, if you do say, okay, rather than defining the value of my functor on this like approximate sine function through composition, I define it uh, as being, as mapping to approximate cosine, uh, then you can actually apply it infinitely. So um, uh, like there's different choices in this discrete category of what this functor can be, and my claim is that like four choices where the functor maps a morphism to some or an approx like a morphism that approximates some real function to a morphism in the bundle that approximates some real function i you know within some bounds get an approximation of the derivatives if i compose it together and you can do better by choosing different morphisms like uh, like by, by choosing differently for this morphism to improve in some sense, the approximation. Uh, but structurally all these morphisms are the same and which one you choose just changes like how good of a job it does at doing differentiation. So, so you know, I guess I, is what you're saying that you, know, you, ha you have these like basic primitive operations which are encoded as functions in Julia and you know that you've got, you know, you can encode their, their their derivatives, you know what they are. So you've got this mapping of functions to derivatives. And so what you're using the kind of categorical structure for is to say, how do I then build these up into kind of the, the, the building the derivative of complex like composite yeah. program. How, so you don't how, need how do to I... have that. But I guess, okay, I, I, I'm, I'm conscious of run, we're running out of time a bit, um, but I, I, I would like just to briefly get a sense of if you could just say a few words about how, how you see this. I mean, I didn't quite understand your kind of optic cube thing. And it would be nice for, for, the, for those of us in the sort of categorical yeah, community I'm happy to, to get a sense of this kind of like about it more. higher order yeah. thing. But I, um, yeah. if you've just got like a couple of minutes just to say, you know, how, how you see that sort of, op what, what that optic cube thing meant and how it relates to the higher order differentiation, that would be nice. Um, but I yeah. guess we should probably stop in a couple of minutes. But, um, okay, so um, uh, let me let me see what the best what the best way to do it is. Okay. Um, well, I guess you, you had this diagram with the kind of optic cube, and you had these like many factors of this um, C, Hom C yeah, 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 function. Yeah. I was just let wondering me, if you could say how well, that me, arose. Let me, let me start. Let me start at a particular place, which is like, let me start at. Um, uh, let me let me start here. Um, so this is so sort of this, this diagram I, I think should be familiar to to people who've seen optics before. And I mean this is basically the definition of the optic, right? I'm, I'm modding out by this equivalence relation of um, p 
pushing the function f you know, across the residual and changing, uh, changing what my residual is. Um, so a statement I want to make here that, you know, may make sense or may not is that I want the Julia optimizer to be able to choose what my residual is because different choices of the residual will have potentially different, like at the very least different storage complexities, right? Because like the residual might be, you know, a huge matrix or like if it's a matrix generated deterministically by some function, you know, there might be just like a seed or like one element that computes what the matrix is. So in some sense, those are equivalent residuals, um, but they have hugely different storage requirements. Um, so in some sense, I'm using optics just to encode uh, a semantic allowance for the Julia optimizer to choose a long ranging residual, um, which is not something that is usually allowed in the semantics of the language because the semantics of the language, like unless you can see like, so the, the semantics of the language are basically that like, the optimizer is allowed to change everything as long as it doesn't change the like uh, observable behavior of how the inputs map to the outputs. Uh, so the problem is like, what if my optimizer can only see like this part of the program, uh, right? And like, it, it can maybe generate R and like it can certainly generate F, but it may not know like, like there's a whole like rest of the program that happens in this like A to A prime gap uh, that my compiler may not be able to see. Um, but the problem is that like naively, according to the semantics of the language, um, the optimizer is not allowed to change S and it's not allowed to change A. Um, so, or, or, or rather it's, it's allowed to, uh, the, the user is allowed to change A, uh, but the optimizer is not. So if the user does some sort of monadic bind, like it can maybe change, uh, the user can maybe change S and A, but it has to be a fixed choice uh, of S and A. Um, but for efficiency, I want the optimizer to be able to like say, well, A is fixed, but actually there's like some sort of long ranging information that like the optimizer should be able to choose. Um, and so what I'm doing here is like, I'm choosing some S and A that I think are reasonable and uh, that like uh, uh, is optimizable and letting the optimizer choose uh, the residual by potentially moving code uh, across, this, um, uh, across this residual boundary. Um, so in some sense, that is what I'm using optics for. Let me, uh, let me pull up the code uh, and like, show you what it would look like in code. Uh, so um, let me pull up the clean version of it and oh, uh, clear the annotations. Uh, um, uh, clear the annotations. So in some sense, uh, like uh, I said, uh, the th code on the right-hand side is an encoding of optics. Um, in in code. So what do I mean by that precisely? I mean that like in this previous diagram, like this first part is what I'm calling L. Uh, the closure that below is what I'm calling R. And like there are some things that are captured by the closure from the forward function. So like this J tan H, for example, uh, certainly uh, like the Z is used down here again, um, right? So there, there's some there, there's some things that are captured, um, and this capture list of the closure is the like a particular choice for the residual of my optic. Uh, but what I want the compiler to be able to do is okay, um, you know, maybe it like it, it doesn't in this example, but in general, like. Um, okay, maybe like this A plus C result um, uh, 
uh, is is never actually used because like the user didn't care about it. Uh, that, that's a very a fairly common situation. In that case, like the compiler, like assuming that like assuming appropriate purity constraints on this uh, 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 delta n h, um, like it would be allowed to move this delta n h into the closure and change what the list of captures is. So you know, no longer capture j tan h, uh, but start capturing b, um, and you know, sort of modify what the capture list is and completely right, analogously. You know. Sorry, sorry to interrupt, you know, I think um, even though there's probably people for whom this is maybe the most interesting and important part of the talk, I worry that uh, we should just wrap up and let people go. So yes, um, sorry. <laughs> why don't we just thank, have everyone thank uh, Kino again. So thanks. Nice to see you. Um, anyone who wants to stay on, feel free and we'll stop the live stream here. So, okay. Yeah. Thanks, David. Sorry, sorry about the mess on that talk. I hope it was still like useful. <laughs> yeah, it's very interesting.